Channel 5, WKRG Television, Mobile, Alabama. <laughs> From WKRG Television News, this is News Center 5, the most trusted report of the day's events. With the news, here's Bob Lee. Hi, everybody. Here's the latest from News Center 5. Secretary of State Kissinger is back in Washington tonight after scoring a diplomatic triumph from the Middle East. We have a late report just in from Andrews Air Force Base. It was two weeks ago tonight that Secretary of State Kissinger departed Washington on his Mideast peace mission. Tonight, he arrived back home, and his boss, who has called the interim peace settlement one of the most historic achievements of this decade, perhaps this century, was here to lead the welcome home celebration. Henry has carried the flag of peace through weeks and weeks of very difficult negotiations. His achievements on this occasion, as in the past, have been remarkable. For the sake of our own people, we should spare no effort to help the nations of the Middle East find a way towards peace. I'm glad that my colleagues and I could make a contribution to this effort in which the willingness to compromise of the parties played such a central role. The President and Secretary of State will hold private discussions at the White House tonight. They will go over what has happened so far and prepare for the mission ahead, which is to convince Congress to go along with the idea of committing up to 200 Americans to help monitor the peace settlement and to provide more than $2 billion in military and economic aid. Phil Jones, CBS News, Andrews Air Force Base, Maryland. State prison officials told a federal court late today that all but 46 of the state's isolation cells have been closed down, and the 46 still in use, they say, meet new minimum standards set by a federal court. Today was the deadline for state prisons to be in compliance with the court's sweeping order. Bill Jordan reports from Holman Prison at Atmore. The federal court has ordered that the punitive isolation units and segregation cells be improved to provide each inmate with certain comforts. He must be fed three meals a day, allowed to shower every other day, and be provided with reading and writing materials. In addition, he must have hot and cold running water, toilet articles, and be allowed to see a counselor at least twice a week. Under the old policy, a prisoner in isolation could be limited to one meal a day, a shower once a week, and one hour of sunshine every 11 days. He must also be supervised around the clock. Warden Taylor Capps had foreseen the court order and begun the renovations months ago. Cap says the prison is in compliance now, but agrees with but Governor Wallace that prisons be, are built to uh, punish lawbreakers and worries about the more lenient attitude demanded by the court order. Isolation. I think that we're going too far to that. Yes, I think we're going too far. I don't. Again, I want to emphasize that I don't believe in uh, punishing prisoners for things that they don't do, and I believe in uh, treating them as humans and giving them the things that they should be given. But I think we're getting carried away in some areas. Yes. Officials may not agree with the reforms, but they are meeting them. Here at Holman Unit near Atmore, the units are up to standard, although the feeling seems to be that given the problems of understaffing, it won't be as easy to control a clean, well-fed inmate as it was to handle them under the old rules. Bill Jordan, New Center 5 in Atmore, Alabama. In sports, Alabama's won a round in its fight with the NCAA, and Jack will have taped highlights from today's tennis action at Forest Hills and a look at the Green Bay Packers, too. If you like it hot, stick around. Bob Massey's got another warm one planned for tomorrow with a high in the mid-90s. Also in the news tonight, the Alabama Farm Bureau Federation says striking longshoremen who are refusing to load grain on ships bound for Russia are looking out for themselves, not consumers. The Public Service Commission granted South Central Bell Telephone Company a $16,700,000 rate hike today, and tonight company officials say that's not enough. Company Vice President Ben Brown told reporters the utility needs every penny of the $59 million it had been asking for. The higher rates approved today will raise the basic monthly charge for telephone service in Alabama for both residential and commercial users. Residential customers with a private line will pay an average of an additional 76 cents a month. In the deal, that new basic monthly rate will be $8.51 plus tax. For businesses, the base rate will be $25.50. 
The commission also granted Bell an across-the-board 4% increase in rates charged for long-distance calls made within the state's borders. In making the adjustment today, the commission demanded that South Central Bell upgrade service in rural areas and refrain from using the new revenue to fatten salaries for top executives. The vote, by the way, in granting the rate hike, two to one, with Commissioner Jim Ziegler voting no. The president of the Alabama Farm Bureau took a, a swipe rather, at striking dock workers today. He said their refusal to load grain into ships bound for the Soviet Union is not motivated by their concern over rising food prices. Instead, he said, the longshoremen are trying to force the grain companies to pay higher shipping rates. Dave Gwynn has an Action Cam report. Hayes made the statement during the morning news conference in which he further stated the American nation vitally depends on the export of agricultural products to offset the skyrocketing cost of foreign oil that we must import. Without agricultural exports, the trade balance in oil alone would cost the American consumer over $26 billion. Hayes stated the weed deal of 1972 between the U.S. and Russia did not contribute to the soaring double-digit inflation problem the U.S. had after the deal. He says wheat being shipped during 1972 cost $1.33 per bushel, while bread cost 24 cents a loaf. In 1974, the price of wheat per bushel rose to $3.57, while bread increased by 10 cents. While just this past June, bread again increased one cent a loaf, while the farmer's cost decreased around 60 cents per bushel. Even though government economists have stated previously the wheat deal of 1972 was a major contributing factor to rising food cost, Hayes doesn't agree. But he stated so that if there isn't a sufficient market for the farmers to sell their products, this could result in a holding back of the production. The but the fact of the matter is that in our present economy, unless it's profitable to produce a crop, then the crop isn't produced. And so you have to have markets for your products, just as General Motors has to have a market for their product. A stated the American consumer pays one cent per loaf for every dollar the farmer makes per bushel if the middleman is left out. David Gwynn, New Center 5. The union boss George Meany, the man who instigated the dock worker strike, defended his position today and in a New York speech attacked Agriculture Secretary Butts and Henry Kissinger too. We've heard a lot of screams. We've heard the screams from the grain operators, the millionaire farm groups, and from Mr. Earl Butts. We've been told that we're pirates. And of course, I think that uh, coming from that industry, coming from the big grain dealers, I think they know something about piracy. And we've been told that we should mind our own business, that we, the American worker, have no right to interfere with American foreign policy. After all, we have a Secretary of State to handle those things, and we, we have a policy known as detente. Many further ridiculed Kissinger by saying he doesn't know what American foreign policy is, that he makes it up from day to day. Vice President Rockefeller got a little help from his friends today. A dozen or so moderate Republicans met for an hour with President Ford and asked him to keep Rockefeller on the ticket next year. Among those attending the meeting, Jacob Javits of New York and Illinois Senator Charles Percy. We researched the subject, and to compensate for Massey's lapse of memory earlier tonight, the height of those 94, and it felt like it. Yes, it certainly did. Well, now, moving on. <laughs> Score one for me. That was very good. 94 comes right between uh, 93 and 95. Here are the satellites, and uh, this shows us that uh, there was some severe weather up around the Great Lakes area today. As a matter of fact, uh, near Lorraine and Oberlin, Ohio, which is about 25 miles southwest of Cleveland, they had some high wind damage, a tornado or two touched down, no reports of injuries or anything like that, and a good deal of rain. Oh, around through the Atlantic and up through the Caribbean Sea and into the Gulf of Mexico, we have no tropical storms, although there are a couple of disturbances down in the uh, Caribbean, meandering around, not doing much. Uh, I don't know whether they're developing anything or not. A couple of them in the eastern end and one near the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, highest winds in one, about 25 miles an hour, a little higher in gusts. 
As I said, uh, this is characteristic. We've, we told you about this before, where you see a warm front running into a cold front. Chances are there's going to be some severe weather, usually just south of where those two meet. That's exactly what happened today up around northern Ohio and into Indiana. Some severe weather, severe thunderstorms, a couple of tornadoes touched down, uh, some trees uprooted, uh, 50 and 60 mile an hour winds, and of course heavy rain. Some of those places still are under severe thunderstorm watch. In our area, a little shower this afternoon to kind of cool things off a little bit. Had some rain over around the Texas and the Louisiana Gulf Coast and a couple of inches down in Tampa, Florida. Otherwise, uh, hot and sunny skies. 62 degrees up in Boston, and our temperatures around the nation. 63 New York City, 83 Miami, 76 Atlanta, 76 Chicago. 72 degrees San Francisco and 65 degrees up in uh, Seattle up there. Our low last night, we had two of them, actually. 30 degrees in Butte, Montana. Also 30 degrees in Evanston, Wyoming, which is uh, 30 or 40 miles east of Gruntville, I think. It's uh, near East Ellen Breath. 111 degrees in Gila Bend, Arizona was the high for today. Temperatures around our area look like this. 77 in Meridian, 79 out in New Orleans, 80 in Pensacola, Fort Walton, 79 up in Montgomery, 77 here in Mobile. There's our marine forecast that covers Apalachicola to Morgan City. Our tides at the mouth of the Mobile River, high tide at 106 tomorrow afternoon, low tide 1042 tomorrow night. Officially up to 5 o'clock, we had no rain. Actually, we had about a quarter of an inch downtown between 5 and 6 here. There's our record high and low in Port Roberts Almanac for this date. Also, our rainfall, and we're a little behind at the moment. A high today, as Bob mentioned, 94. Low last night, 75. Right now, moving right along, it's 77 degrees. And our humidity at 88%. The barometer, 30.07. And rising winds out of the northeast at 3 miles an hour. Here's where it's going to be for tomorrow. About a 20% chance of rain. A lot of sunshine in between times. Wind should be northeasterly, rather southeasterly. 4 to 12 miles an hour. High temperature tomorrow, again, it's going to be a hot one. Probably hotter than it was today in the mid-90s. Low tonight, the mid-70s. And uh, if we lose our cloud cover, and it's getting uh, to be pretty clear in the sky out there, it may get just a little bit cooler in the mid-70s tonight. It may get down even as low as 72 or 73, but it's still going to be a pretty warm night. All right. Thank you, Bob, very much. A tense drama is being unfolded at this hour in Albany, New York. Police there have surrounded a downtown luncheonette where a bandit is holed up with several hostages, including three young children. We have a report from Doug Pauling in New York. The incident began in mid-afternoon when a man holding a pistol walked into the city and county savings bank on State Street in Albany. He took some cash from the tellers, then ran after a bank guard, striking him on the head. The robber ran out of the bank and fired at pursuing police officer John Fisher. The officer was hit but not seriously hurt. The robber continued his attempt to escape, running up the street into the standard sandwich coffee shop. The people in the shop, believed to be 10, including several children, became hostages. Police used bullhorns and the telephone to try to talk to the gunman, but he refused to say anything. More police and FBI agents, armed with rifles and tear gas guns, surrounded the shop. The gunman has refused to talk to police, but there is one unconfirmed report that he has asked to negotiate with New York Governor Hugh Carey. This is Doug Poling, CBS News, New York. An Air Force B-52 exploded in flight over South Carolina today, killing three of its seven crewmen. The other four parachuted to safety, but did suffer injuries. Among the dead is an Alabama airman, identified as Lieutenant Melvin Buley of Birmingham. The Air Force says the plane was on a routine training mission and carried no bombs. One of Governor Wallace's get tough anti crime measures passed the Senate Judiciary Committee today. It calls for mandatory life prison sentences for anybody convicted a second time of selling or even possessing certain hard narcotics. The life term would be given second offenders caught with as little as an ounce of heroin, morphine, or cocaine. Marijuana not included in the bill. Jimmy Hoffa's so-called foster son went before a Detroit grand jury today but refused to cooperate with investigators looking into Hoffa's disappearance. Randy Daniels has more on the story. O'Brien arrived with his attorney, James Burdick, amid allegations by the government that he is a central figure in Hoffa's disappearance. He waited for nearly an hour and a half before being called to testify, but actually spent only six minutes before the panel. Attorney Burdick hinted that O'Brien took the Fifth Amendment when questioned by investigators. Following the session, Burdick lashed out at government strike force attorneys for broadening the investigation to include what he considered unrelated union affairs. It has become quite clear that Mr. O'Brien's good faith efforts to assist in the investigation have been met by an antagonistic and subtly accusatorial posture taken by some members of the Justice Department. His desire to be cooperative has been repaid by a leaking of innuendos, unsupported hypotheses, and groundless accusations, all obviously designed to bring some sort of pressure to bear on Mr. O'Brien and his family. 
There is a possibility O'Brien will be recalled by the grand jury as the investigation continues. Meanwhile, the FBI has turned its attention to Joseph Zarelli, another reputed Detroit Mafia leader. Agents have been trying to find the reclusive Zarelli to serve a subpoena to appear before the grand jury. Randy Daniels, CBS News, Detroit. Looks like stripper Fanny Fox has saved one of the juiciest details of her affair with Congressman Wilbur Mills for her autobiography, which is for sale, by the way. Ms. Fox told a New York news conference today that she became pregnant by Mills in late 1973, then had an abortion against his wishes. Ms. Fox called the news conference, of course, to plug her new book. Now, what's this about Alabama in court? Well, it's a tough act to follow, Sandy Fox, <laughs> okay. I'll tell you. But Alabama has gained a partial court victory over the NCAA limits on football squad size. The federal court ruled the NCAA cannot limit traveling squads to 48 men, that their home team limit of 60 must apply to both teams. At Forest Hills today, the women moved on to the semifinal round as Martina Navratilova, Virginia Wade, Ivan Gulagoncali, and Chris Everett all won in the quarterfinals. Ivan Gulagoncali is nearest as we watch what turned out a surprising struggle. The opponent is Japan's Kazuka Sawamatsu, the Japanese star suffered a recurrence of a back injury during the match. And despite playing in intense pain, he extended Ivan to 7-6, seven, 7-5 seven, score. become the most dominant clay court player women's tennis has seen, Chris Abbott. She's nearest us here, disposing of yet another opponent with ridiculous ease. As Chris dusted Australia's Kerry Melville Reed 6261, she was extending her clay court winning streak to 82 consecutive matches. Baseball in the American League, a big meeting in the East. The leaders in the East, Boston in first place, second place, Baltimore, they went 10 innings. Then Boston Cecil Cooper led off the 10th with a home run, and Boston won it 3-2. to two. In the seventh inning, second place in the West, Kansas City was leading the Chicago White Sox 2-1. to one. New York shut out Detroit, the 19th pitching victory for Catfish Hunter. Incidentally, Charlie Finley is going to court over Catfish again tomorrow. Cleveland is leading Milwaukee in the seventh inning. The game in California is just getting started. In the National League, Leader in the East, Pittsburgh, still going strong. Beat New York 3-1. to one. Dropped the Mets back into fourth place six games back. St. Louis, erstwhile second in the East, is tied with Chicago in the seventh inning at six apiece. Philadelphia has won. They beat Montreal. That moved them into third place pending the St. Louis result. And uh, in the seventh inning, Cincinnati, leader in the West, by 18 and a half games over Los Angeles, has almost made that the score. It's 13 to one in the seventh inning. San Diego defeated Atlanta, San Francisco beat Houston. We'll look into Bart Starr's progress at Green Bay. Bart Starr, Alabama boy who made good faces his biggest challenge as the new coach of the Green Bay Packers trying to repair what the natives call a divine disaster. Here's a progress report. In to return Packer football to its once proud tradition, the Packers have turned to the field general of the glory years, Bart Starr. In recent years, Green Bay football had become showered with off-field distractions. Starr's first objective centered on returning attention to the field of play. Yet he received early setbacks involving many of the few All-Pro players he inherited. Linebacker Ted Hendricks turned his back on the pack and headed for Oakland. Guard Gail Gillingham decided to retire at age 31. Cornerback Ken Ellis left camp twice over contract disputes and is now playing out his option. Star, quiet but strong, weathered the early off-field problems, and Packer fans now seem to think of football in terms of the game. But on the field, Star has other problems. The Packer defense will be the team's forte, but the offense has retained the inability to score touchdowns. The Packers do have their first proven veteran quarterbacks and star himself retired in John Hale, 
But in acquiring Halo, the Packers shipped their top draft selections this year to Los Angeles, with others L.A. bound next year. Thus, rebuilding through the draft will likely be a tedious process, though the Packers might have found a nugget of gold from the West Coast in their third-round choice, Will Harrell. When Starr accepted the Green Bay job, he asked for the prayers and patience of Packer fans. The feeling here is he will get both. Fans seem, for the moment, content to think respectability rather than Super Bowl, knowing that brighter days and starrier nights are indeed ahead. The American Basketball Association has moved their Memphis team to Baltimore, where the new owners, being somewhat naive, wanted to indicate a hustling team by nicknaming them the Baltimore Hustlers. Unfortunately, Baltimore is a somewhat seamy city, and its citizens, as on its streets, find a hustler is something else again. They are having a contest to come up with a new name. <laughs> <laughs> you got any guesses what it might be? <laughs> the Hustlers. <laughs> Mark Krim has some thoughts about murder, and we'll hear them after this. Murder is often committed by a person you'd least expect to commit a crime, the quiet, unemotional type. Mark Krim has news on a study that might cut down the number of murders that are committed.